If you test the speed of light of the spot of free, this is just the, the relation between the, the for, for, uh, for the radiation plasma, for the radi radiation fluid. And so it follows this, the horizon, so if we have lambda here, that, uh, and this is the horizon, lambda horizon, the lambda genes follow it very closely, okay, until roughly an equality. Later on, one can show that it becomes a constant, and this, as this written before, uh, the photons decouple from the baryons. Okay, so at some point, a little bit later, not that much later, after we begin, the universe begins to be uh, matter dominated, the photons decouple from the baryons. And at that point, there's no pressure anymore, and one can show that this gene scale drops. Okay, so this is what happened, this is the rough picture for, uh, and I guess here there's a change in the slope simply because the horizon grows differently between uh, radiation and matter. I right? remember the horizon if you just h to the minus 1, and I'm reminding you that h squared, according to the Friedman equation, is just rho, a by g of c rho. Um, and rho in, in matter, in radiation dominated, goes like a to the minus 4, and it goes like a to the minus 3 for um, matter domination. So h has changed at the slope here. So this is the picture for the gene scale. For baryons, they basically, there is no structure for any scale, for scales. Lambda smaller than lambda genes, uh, there's no structure. Simply, uh, for those scales, the radiation kind of pushes any structure and, and raises any over density, over dense regions. So this is the picture for baryons. The question is what happens when we introduce dark matter? When we introduce dark matter, of course, it doesn't come to uh, the photons, and therefore the picture is slightly different. And for dark matter, the G, the, the, this uh, relevant scale below which there are no, uh, there's no uh, uh, structure, structure is being uh, washed out, is called a uh, free spinning scale. Green scale. Lambda is green. So now we want to figure out what it is. And there are two uh, and it's crucial that this scale uh, so that the, the this scale crucially depends on how whether dark matter is relativistic or not. So we know that dark matter is just gonna start moving out. And for the time scale of for growth of perturbation, the question is how much it travels. So it matters whether it is a, a relativistic or not. So if it just decouples non-relativistically, if it was in thermal equilibrium with the early universe and then it decouples non-relativistically, then it, it propagates very slowly, the velocity is very slow, and therefore uh, there's just no issue, there's no problem with the, the free spinning. I mean, this scale is very small, and hence, uh, we, perturbations can grow freely, which means that uh, they don't interrupt any scale that we see today in the universe. Okay, so for non-relativistic, for dark matter, you write it down, for dark matter that decouples non-relativistically, there is no problem. No problem, I mean no constraint, this scale is very small, smaller than the scales that we actually measure, and therefore uh, there's no problem. What we're going to see is that there's a bound on this free streaming, because if we erase two large perturbations, then they correspond to, and that means that the structure that we actually see today should not be there, and therefore there's going to be a bound on this scale of free streaming. Okay. However, what happens when a uh, dark matter decouples relativistically, then we need to differentiate between two cases. So, for dark matter, the decouples relativistically. There are two scales. Um, 
is the point where the dark matter becomes non-relativistic. So it becomes non relativistically, but then it redshifts, and it slowly, at some point, it will become non-relativistic. If it happens before the equality time, this is what we call warm dark matter. And if it happens after equality time, <coughs> this is what we call hot dark matter. <coughs> okay? So, we'll see, we'll discuss, we'll, we'll assume this part, and we will see that this is uh, even, even worse, right? Because if it's relativistic at equality, then the free spinning length is going to be even larger. And so this kind of dark matter is excluded. This is excluded. And let's work out what happens in the warm case. What's that matter? Is that clear? Are there any questions? It's a picture clear, yeah. Um, how do you work out the free spinning scale? Is it sort of like We'll do it now. So, yeah. So let's assume a, a few things. Okay. So we're going to assume the following. First, that matter decouples relativistically. Second, let's assume that dark matter interacts with itself or with it without uh, regular matter, only via gravitation, gravity, so only gravitation. And three, as we said, we discussed the whole dark matter, so we we'll assume that n non relativistic is more than n. And given this assum these assumptions, we want to uh, to figure out what is the free spinning length, so it's not very difficult. So just recall that, the, that the, um, what is the velocity in the co-moving volume in the, in, sorry, in the, in the expanding universe? The velocity is just a dr dt. So this is the, so I remind you that A is just a scale factor, so locally there's some velocity, but uh, if we look at the velocity or the, the effect also due to the expansion, but this is just the velocity, okay? And that just means that the R equals, uh, uh, what did I want to say, a V over A dt. Okay. And let's define the co-moving free spinning. So I'm not. So this is co-moving. So co-moving means that we are talking about the uh, the scale locally without taking into account the expansion, which means that the the, the, the proper length, the proper scale free spinning length is going to be the co-moving one times a. So I'm not going to write co-moving anymore. But in any scale we're discussing right now is just co-moving. Okay. So who was Heard already about co-moving scale? Okay, all of you, all of you, excellent. All right, so that's, that's a number, okay, so what is it? It is just, you know, r at some time t minus r at some time t zero. How much that matter propagated? And then just the integral of v over a dt from t zero to some t. So let's just estimate that, how much is it? Well, we know what we care about is how much dark matter propagated roughly at uh, the time scale of growth of perturbation, right? We want to know how much it managed to escape before uh, the perturbation had time to grow due to gravity. So we said that the time of perturbation, dt perturbation goes by the n over a dot, right? And this is the only scale for perturbation growth. One can show, in fact, that uh, the growth of perturbation go like a to some power, where m is 1 for a matter combination and m is 2 for matter, and m equals 2 for radiation domination. 
that's not important. But either way, if this is the growth, this is the rate of growth of perturbation, the time scale, the relative time scale is still some number, or the one number times A over A dot. It's, it's, it's a, the, this is the only scale of the problem. And therefore, lambda free streaming is of all there uh, V over A dot, right? V over A times delta T. Okay? So what is this? How does it behave? <coughs> okay. So what happens at A um, when A is smaller than A non-relativistic? Okay, so case one. Before that matter became non-relativistic, that's easy. V is just C, it is relativistic, so V is just 1. Okay. And what is A dot? Well, remember that H, again, H goes like the square root of the energy density. The energy density goes like A to the minus 4 in radiation domination, so this is proportional to A to the minus 2. This is just A dot over A. So A dot is proportional to A to the minus 1. This please. Yeah, everyone knows the flow goes like A to the minus 4. Who, who, who has heard this before? Well, in radiation domination, so it goes like A to the minus 1. Excellent. So A dot goes like A to the minus 1, and therefore lambda free streaming goes like a 1 over a dot, which is, goes like, which is a. So the free streaming length grows with the expansion as long as that matter is relativistic. Okay? What happens when uh, a is between, became non-relativistic, but before equality? Okay, well, we know that for a, the momentum always gets redshifted due to the expansion, so the momentum always goes like a to the minus 1, but when that matter is non-relativistic, this is just mv, so that means that v also goes like a to the minus 1, and therefore that means that uh, nothing changed here, we are still in, in, in radiation domination, so a dot goes like a to the minus 1, therefore lambda free streaming goes like a to the minus 1 over a to the minus 1, which is just 1. Namely, it's constant. So when it becomes non-relativistic and before matter the radiation equality, the free streaming length is constant. So what happens at... Um, What happens when A is uh, smaller than, larger, sorry, than A equality? After equality, A dot over A, which goes like square root of rho, goes like A to the minus 3 halves, and therefore A dot goes like A to the minus 1 half, and therefore um, lambda free streaming just goes like A to the minus 1 over A to the minus 1 half, which is a to the minus one So if we draw this, again we have A non-relativistic, we have A equality, and we have A decoupling, which we don't care about right now. And before, while this non-relativistic grows, just like the horizon, so we follow the horizon, so this would be the horizon, well, I think the space, but here it would change. So this is lambda horizon, this is lambda free streaming. And when it becomes non relativistic, it becomes constant, and then it starts to drop. So if we want to know what is the larger scale which gets erased because the dark matter free streams outside, then what we need to know is what is the free streaming length at the time where uh, dark matter becomes non-relativistic. So this is the largest scale that would be erased by the free streaming. 
So all we need to do is work this out. If we work this out, we will know um, what is the largest, the smallest scale that we should see in our galaxy, in our universe. And we do, we do these measurements, we have a bound, and that tells us uh, this, this, this thing will depend, of course, on the mass of the dark matter, so this will give us a bound on the, on the mass of the dark matter. Is this clear? Are there any questions? I'm doing it a little bit fast, but uh, just stop me from you lost me. So this scenario is for cold dark no, 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 no. We, in the assumption we said that the three things. If it's cold dark matter, it's very slow. It, it, there's no, this growth doesn't exist. And it immediately starts falling and there's no, there's no strain. It's going to be perfectly fine. We'll see that, uh, so, we, we, so we said if it's cold dark matter, it's fine. If it's uh, warm dark matter, what does it mean? Dark matter decoupled relativistically. So we decouple from the plasma, it was relativistic. This uh, could happen, say, for the gravitino or for many other uh, particles. We get that soon. But, so it decoupled when it was relativistic, but still it became more relativistic before, before matter radiation uh, equality. Okay, that's what that matter. If it would have become non relativistic after equality, that would have been a different story. That would be, uh, be the difficult hot dark matter, where it becomes non relativistic here. And you see that this is already a strong constraint, this is completely excluded. Okay, so hot dark matter is excluded, warm dark matter is still okay, but uh, to some extent we're we'll trying to work out the bound. So, so AD coupling is for variance? Yeah, yeah, AD coupling is a totally different kind. AD coupling is when baryons and the photons are decoupled. Right? Where atoms become uh, neutral. <coughs> At uh, roughly A, I think it's 3600 or something like that. Okay. Yeah, so what we need to do now is to calculate the uh, free streaming length at a time where that matter became, where it became non relativistic. And this will give us the whole answer. Okay, so back to the equation, you just integral the t of v over a, right? And we want this at, um, yeah, and that equals the a, v over a squared h, right? Just because uh, t goes like, h to the minus 1, which is um, a over a dot. Well, yeah. I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess. In other words, it is that dt equals dA dt over dA. And they're just a dot, the a over a dot, and a dot is just a times h. Okay. So now a squared h is just a constant uh, during radiation domination. So remember, we are here. We are calculating it here. So this is just a h squared again, a pi over three m prime squared times. Uh, rho radiation, which is, I'm going to write it as 8 pi over 3 m plus squared times rho critical times rho radiation as a function of a over rho critical. Rho c, which is just a naught times omega r naught, well, naught times a naught to the fourth over a to the fourth. Okay, so I just, re I just rewrote it. It's the critical, it's the critical Hubble, uh, uh, Hubble scale times the radiation, which goes like a to the minus four. So just a re -re rewriting of the uh, Friedman equation. So that's squared here, I guess. So that means that a squared h 
is just h naught times the square root of omega r, and I'm, I'm working in the unit where a naught is to a today is one. Okay, so that's my units. Yeah. Okay, so the free streaming length. And so lambda free streaming is just h naught to the minus one, right where it is, it's just there, it's just there. It's uh, yeah, it's a naught to the minus minus one, omega r to the minus one half times a when it became a relativity. Right? This is this is a constant which I took out it's here. Times b, which is one, because we are just becoming more relativistic, and the a just gives me a and r. Okay. So all we need to know is what was the scale at which uh, the particle became more relativistic. If we know that, we know the free streaming length. We're going to have a bound on this, and this will give us a bound on the scale, which is related to the mass. Let's just do that. And so take your favorite dark matter model and calculate how it decoupled from the uh, plasma, from the thermal bath. If it decoupled relativistically, calculate when it became non-relativistic, so you know what is the uh, energy that it decoupled, when it decoupled, right? It was produced, say, non-relativistically and very fast with some energy, because something decayed to it. So you know what is its energy when it decoupled, then you know what is its energy when it uh, became non-relativistic, what is the scale when it became non-relativistic, and if you have that, you're going to have a bound on the mass. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. 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 All right, so let's briefly do that. Well, because uh, the entropy is just constant, and it's given by G star S uh, times P cubed A cubed. This is just the adiabatic statement about the expansion of the universe. Because of that, we know that A is just G star S at some uh, uh, today of the G star S at some other time to the one third. This is just constant times T naught of T times A zero, which is uh, I'll to be one. T0 I also know, it's related to the entropy. Now, what is the temperature where the dark matter becomes non-relativistic? Almost. Just, uh, you know, half the V squared is 3 halves the P, right? The three view. So the temperature when it becomes non relativistic, becomes non relativistic, uh, is m over 3. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to denote this the temperature of the dark matter. Remember that by now, the temperature, the dark matter is already decoupled from the thermal bath. If it decouples from the thermal bath, that means that it has its own temperature, which is not necessarily the same temperature as the photons in the thermal bath. So I'm going to know that as T and R of calm, just to remind ourselves that this could be a different temperature. Good, so we can write A, when it became non-relativistic, as G star S today over G star S at T and R times T naught divided by T and R T and R over uh, T and R chi, T and R chi over T and R. So that's the ratio of temperatures at the time that it became more relativistic between the dark matter and the okay. photon. Is, is this clear? I'm going to note that as a sign, it's often denoted as a sign. The ratio of the temperature between the dark matter and us. And that's it. This is just n chi over 3. 
So we can plug it, we can plug everything uh, in here, and we get a and r as a function of the mass and some ratio which is model dependent, which tells us what is the difference between the temperature in the dark sector, in the in the dark matter sector, and us. Okay. So let me just tell you the answer. Okay, so we plug it back in, and what we find is that lambda free screening is roughly 0.4 kV over m chi times psi in megapascal. So again, it depends on roughly kV for the dark mass of the dark matter, and it depends on this psi. And it turns out that the bound is roughly 0.2 megapascal. Okay. So that's the right bound from, from observation, which means that the dark matter cannot be much lighter than uh, kV. The sun dependent, water dependence on the ratio of temperature, but it cannot be uh, below kV because then it's too hot and uh, too warm. And it interferes with the observation of that large structure formation. Okay? So that's the first treatment bound in the nutshell. Question? So you say A0 is today? Yeah, I'm undefining to be one, so that's my normalization. Uh -huh. But doesn't that um, the scaling of the whole constant break down before, before today? Doesn't it start going as? Yeah, eight, eight to the minus three. Yeah, yeah I feel you're right. Actually, you're you're very, you're absolutely right. I was not careful. It really should be eight quarter. And this is radiation eight quarter. Thank you. You're right. You're very good. Absolutely. Okay. <coughs> so. That's the end of um, free streaming. There is a. Um, there are more bounds, so I don't have time to go over them because we are uh, uh, running out of time. But um, let me just quickly mention them. There are limits on self, on self interaction. So, on top of the fact that that matter can. Uh, uh, ruining structure formation. We also have limits on self-interaction by looking at some kind of astrophysical uh, objects. Two well-known limits. One of them is uh, the bullet, sorry, the bullet cluster. And the other one is known as tail shape. This is simple, You've, I've, I've told you about the Golden Cluster already. These are two clusters of galaxies that collided, and we see a snapshot. And the picture that we saw is that there is this bullet here, there is this uh, regular matter that peaks, uh, that for which the peak is displaced compared to the uh, peak of the overall mass of the cluster. This is uh, through gravitational landing, and this is through X-rays. And this displacement tells us that if dark matter was too strongly interacting, the interpretation here is that the two classes went through each other, and because variants interact more strongly with each other, they kind of slow down, while dark matter just went through it. So if, that just tells you that if dark matter would interact with itself too strongly, it would imply that the displacement has not been seen. And that gives you a bound on the cross section. So I won't, I won't derive it, but that gives you a bound on the self interaction cross section over the mass, which is anywhere between, say, roughly less than one uh, uh, centimeter squared per bound. Okay. So that's the bound that one derives by from something like this. There's another bound on the halo shapes. If dark matter would interact with itself uh, strongly, then it would cause uh, it was it would um, the clusters would be more isotropic 
because uh, it would share its energy uh, better, and therefore we expect more spherical halos. But for a, a elliptical galaxies, we see that this is not true; that the halos are actually elliptical, and that places a bound on sigma over n. Again, and there's a debate of what exactly is this bound. There's recent papers that claim that the original bound, which were anywhere between, say, 0.1 and 0.1 centimeters squared per gram, are actually too strong and it's closer to 0.1 to 1 again. So then there's still debate on what exactly is the bound from self interactions due to energy. Okay? Now, there are interesting reasons to maybe believe that. Uh, that uh, that one is self interacting, so I won't go through it. One of them, I won't go through them in detail, one of them is called the co versus cast, the predictions for collisionless for that matter, for which we do these embodied simulations often, uh, kind of predict these cast P profiles that we discussed. However, what they actually see in both galaxies, these are galaxies which are very faint because they are mostly made of dark matter, uh, small galaxies that are mostly made of dark matter and are very faint. In those galaxies, it seems like the, car, the profile is much more shallow and it's not cusp in the center. That could occur if there's more uh, self-interaction. Okay. The other thing is that uh, these collisionless cold dark matter simulations predict many large, or more than 10, say, large uh, galaxies around us that um, have a large velocity for which we should see large velocities for the rotation curves. We don't see those galaxies. This is called so called uh, too big to fail uh, uh, problem. Uh, again, this could be explained if, for instance, the, there is less mass inside those galaxies. Uh, for example, if it was shallower, uh, maybe it's explained by self interaction. So they are now. It's a, it's a, it's a hot topic. People are working on it, we don't know the answer, but some claim that there is some evidence for a self interaction of the dark matter, others claim it's not strong, and we have to uh, wait and see, well, we have to work on it and figure out which one is correct. Alright, so, so this is, the, is this the reason why dark matter cannot be colored? <coughs> colored? Yes. Oh, if dark matter was colored, that was sort of so many reasons. It would annihilate too fast. And it would, uh, well, if it was a bounce state, uh, oh, or it would have strong. It would well, it would still annihilate uh, pretty fast, mm -hmm. right? Through into blue, I guess. It's very important dependent. You would still see, you would probably see the reputation too strongly. You would uh, get too strong self interactions, uh, too large. I think everything is It's very much like uh, charge. I didn't talk about, say, bound from charge, but it's pretty strong. So we know it's not charge, it's easy, right? not a monopole charge, right? An electric monopole. But that's actually. Mm -hmm. But for color, it's. So this is one way. Um, okay, models of dark matter, we have very little luck, very little time, and uh, we could have easily just spent the uh, last six lectures talking about only talking about models. And so I had to make a choice. Uh, chose only two children. So One of them is the gravitational dark matter, and the other one on the axon. This is because I chose that because it's interesting, not only it's related to supersymmetry, it's also kind of shows you you have to you go back to all of the production mechanisms we discussed. So interestingly, this is a we do that now. This is uh, just to show you a model which could easily be true, it's highly motivated and uh, everything I 
I showed you in these six lectures is uh, almost everything doesn't hold for the accents. So there's a whole, we could, we could really spend six lectures just on the accents. It's, it's a very interesting candidate. Um, yeah. So there are many more. If I have time, I would have done a hidden sector dark matter. I think it's very interesting and it's a hot topic. And uh, one thing which you should all know about, and I suggest you go and read, maybe this will be the last exercise, the neutralino dark matter. Neutralino of the of the supersymmetry. It's a highly studied model. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Okay. Alright, so Gravitino. So the Gravitino um, is this superpower of the graviton. David uh, mentioned it yesterday. Um, its mass, the mass of the Gravitino, is f over n plank, and we think we know and we know its interactions, and we follow some conservation of the current, the supercurrent, but if the gradient is roughly that, and And this J is this uh, supercurrent, which for us all we care about goes like psi e phi minus lambda a f a. Namely, this is for some multiplet. This is the same fermion and the fermion. Okay, and this would be the uh, gauge boson and the genome. Okay, so, so the Gravitino interacts both with the Gaginos and the Bosons and with the scalar and fermion part of the, uh, of the super okay. However, because it couples only weakly, so F here is the scale of supersymmetry breaking. David uh, showed you that it's just the F term. Uh, because typically this is very large, the interaction of the Gravitino with us, here, with us, then, then its interaction with us is very uh, suppressed, and hence uh, it is never, well, it's not true, but uh, often it is not in thermal equilibrium. Certainly not when it's heavy. And therefore, there are uh, other ways of, uh, of producing it in the early universe. It is becoming, uh, it does become thermal as, as the mass drops. And I will show you the plot and then you calculate it. It's not simply a simple, uh, difficult to calculate. But so, there really is everything. It is thermal when it's light, when it's heavy, uh, the production goes through all of the other ways we discussed. So let me uh, sum the other words. So how is it being produced? Uh, well, so the first one is through scattering. You have a gluino that couples the gluon. This is the gluino. And sorry, and that's the gravitino. So this is the diagram. You have scattering between gluinos and gluons. Okay? And this one you know, once in a while produce this gravitino. The coupling here is simply 
m gluido over f. We just follow from this, while we need to remember that the derivative that gives us this mass. Okay? So what is the rate? How much dark matter is being produced? How much protein is being produced by that? Let's calculate one. Well, let's calculate the rate first. Well, so what is the rate? Roughly, who wants to go? Okay. Yeah. It's easy. And we did it before. Okay, you know it's proportional to. How does it depend on the copy? Square. Square. Copy there is M Gluino. Over F squared. The other couple we're going to ignore right now. Just from the proof. Okay, and then the just it's scattering is just proportional to n to the number density, which is called like e cubed. So very, very roughly this is it. So what is y? Y from scattering. So this is and goes over f squared times t cubed times over n plus times n plus over t. This is the apple. So that's given by m log squared over f squared n plus times t squared. Times t, and so we are dominated. The larger the temperature, the, the more we produce. So we, this production is dominated at high energy. This is a UV sensitive production, and therefore the temperature here is just the really temperature. Okay. <coughs> Using this, we can write this as theory heat and squared over n3 half squared n times. Okay? I rewrote f with the uh, Okay. There is also crazy. That's the second way of producing it. Every now and then, a superpartner can decay into, say, a squad, can decay into a quark and a gravitino. Again, this is due to the, this interaction. So this is again n over f, and therefore y is just given by um, this squared. But then, but then we, we uh, just when I mentioned, we end to the three over n3 half to a big plan. n plan squared. So this is the rate times n plan over t squared. This is the freezing that we saw. Go back to the notebook and you see that we work this out precisely. And so that goes like some number times m over m3 half squared n plus. So I should say there's of course a number here. This number tends to be 10 to the minus 4, turned out to be 10 to the minus 4. This number is also roughly 10 to the minus 4. So there are coefficients which we are not writing. 
Finally, there's a what other process to produce the gravitinos that we learned about. Let's see. Regular freeze-out we discussed already, but that's not the case here. We said it's not thermal. Freezing we discussed. Gravitino is certainly not asymmetric. So the NLSP, which is in the standard model, so freeze out and decay, the NLSP in the standard model freezes out and eventually decays to the gravitino. So we know that this is true. And that goes like 1 over m plus sigma v times m nlsp, which is some number times m over alpha square m plus. Well, here, so, like we took sigma v over the alpha square over m square, just as before. Good, so we have. Um, So we have these uh, three, three things. If we look at temperature, at theory heat, we have the scattering. At the mass, we have the freezing. This is dominated at n equals n twiddle, the mass of this guy. And a little bit below, there was a key freeze out. So remember that freeze out occurs below the mass of the uh, particle, namely roughly of order 20 below the mass of the particle, you remember that we had x freeze out that was z freeze out, whatever. That was roughly of order 20, 25. Do you remember that number? The time, this is m over t. And so the, the mass of the dark matter, in this case it's the the speed, that freezes out when the temperature is roughly 120 compared to its mass. Remember that when we saw the regular freeze out. So now we're freezing out the NLSP and then it decays and it, uh, every, it passes all its number density to the gravitinos and that occurs at the temperature slightly below the mass, uh, the supersymmetric mass scale. So this is freeze out the decay. So now we can ask well, what is the bound? Okay, so that's the picture for the production of the gravitinos. We can ask what is the bound? And we derive this equation We derive this equation, this is the bound so that the gravitino doesn't over overcrowd the universe. you remember that? We derived it by just uh, showing that if this equals that, then you get the exact right number density. We related the equality to the densities that we measure today. So again, look back at your uh, notebook. So now this is just the sum of these three contributions. So it's some number over n3 half times theory heat n twiddle squared over n plus. This is the scattering. Plus some number over n3 half times n will cube over n plant. This is the freezing plus some number times n three halves times n quiddle over alpha squared n plant. All that has to be less than t quality. You notice that here it goes like 1 over n3 halves, and here it goes like n3 halves. So there's going to be an alpha bound. Namely, if we draw so this is the, if you want the master plot for this gravitino, if we draw n3 halves 
as a function of n trivials. So there are three parameters here. There's theory heat, there's the mass of the supersymmetry, the soft masses of the superpartners, and there's the mass of the gravitino. So let's just assume, let's just keep this constant for a given, for, for, for a second, so I assume that this is just larger than, M, M, than the soft masses, but or equal to the soft masses. Therefore, this is that about the same, and so if this is n to the minus 7, and this is n to the minus 6, so I'm going to draw here a huge number of, uh, or huge, many orders of magnitude, then the plot goes like that, m3 halves, uh, so at small m3, when s3 half is small, this is dominant. So this is the freezing. At some point, the freeze out becomes dominant. And I need more, more space. At some point, the freeze out becomes dominant. There's a line here that I should draw. This is the line where m3 half equals m twiddle. Okay. So of course, when m three half equal after once m three half is, is heavier than m two, the dark matter becomes uh, the NLS, the NSP, the neutralino, <coughs> and it's just constant. Of course, it doesn't depend on um, um, it doesn't depend on the mass of the gravitino. So this is neutralino dark matter. Here the gravitino is the lightest. And this is because of freeze out in the cave. This is because of freezing. Everything here is excluded. At some point there's a line here. Let me call it thermal. So this line, behind it, gravitino becomes thermal. So this is what we worked out. We worked out that there's a bound here. Uh, this is roughly 50 TeV. But the gravity, uh, sorry, the superpartner have to be lighter than roughly 50 TeV in order for the gravitino not to overclose the universe. Is this clear how we got this plot? Did just this part of the plot? Who understood it? Okay, so I need to... No choice, but it's not done. Um, so what we need to do, we have this. And we need to make sure that uh, this bound is fulfilled. So let's, for a second, assume that this is dominated over this. They both go like one over and three half. So let's let's take just this one and this one. And this is assume this is subdominant. Subdominant. So we can find out at which uh, T read it, there's a meeting point here where this equals that. That will tell us what this theory is saying. Um, T read it. Okay? Actually, let me write it down. Be a little bit clearer. Uh, so the meeting point here is when m three half roughly equals theory heat over m three times alpha m three. Okay. So I can just solve and ask when does this equal that? This is this point here. Below this point, this is larger than that. <laughs> okay? And for a given region temperature, I just have a line that relates, because of this inequality, I just have a line that relates m3 half of m squared. This is this line. Above this point, this is dominant. And again, I have a line between m3 halves and m twiddle. But now m twiddle goes like 1 over m3 halves. So it goes down. So 
this is this one. So this is dominated by free dot and decay. This is dominated by freezing. If you go above this line, we are producing too many gravitinos and the model is excluded. If we are below this line, we are fine. Or not. Okay, is this clear? What are the units on the bottom? Yeah, that's a good question. So, whatever, this is, uh, I guess, GV. Thank you, this is a very good point. And this is M quick, whatever, quite a lot. GV. Good. <coughs> okay, so now more information that we did work out. If we keep on moving, to lower and lower that, uh, gravitino masses, we're going to be producing more and more gravitinos, right? The production of like one over every half. At some point, the production will be so strong that we will thermalize the gravitinos. This is this line. Just the condition when the y produced for the gravitinos is equals the thermal distribution of the gravitinos. So this is this line. Below it, we are thermal, but we are hot. So, there is this region where we are simply hot and we still overclock the universe. So we are produ still producing too much and we overclock the universe. We need to go even further down for us, for the dark matter not to overclock the universe. And somewhere around 10 to the minus 8, this is, uh, we, are, we get the right abundance, but we are too warm. Dark matter, you see, this is 10 to the minus 8, which is 10 EV, and we said the dark matter needs to be roughly above KV, you know, that not to, uh, for the free streaming not to be too large. So this dark matter is too warm. We can tolerate a little bit of warm dark matter, we cannot tolerate a lot, so the bound is roughly 10%. So we allow for 10% of dark matter to be warm, uh, and the rest has to be colder. So there's a region here, where we are, that pattern is roughly 10%, 10% gravitinos, and this is warm. Below the region, here we are allowed, we don't overclose the universe. Gravitino is not the dark matter, but we don't overclose the universe. So again, this is excluded. And in this region here, let me not go into it. Theoretically, this cannot explain. It's just the relation between the mass of the gravitino and the mass of the soft parameter are related through the scale of the breaking, and it's inconsistent in this region. So, inconsistent. So, this is the plot for the gravitino dark matter scenario. Here, we are allowed. This is the limit. It's interesting that independent of the fine-tuning problem, and independent of anything, we find that if gravitino is really dark matter, and if the reheat temperature was large enough to reheat all the soft parameters, we assume that they are thermal, all the soft uh, superpartners, the super then the mass, the scale of supersymmetry needs to be pretty low. So this is a different, if you want, motivation for low-scale supersymmetry. Not necessarily, it doesn't mean that we find it at the LMC, clearly, if it's 50 TV, we won't find it, but it's a motivation for supersymmetry, an independent motivation. If we, this is for the reading temperature, this is when the reading equals M. If we make the reading temperature even larger, then we get overproduce and the bound becomes stronger. So this is as the reading grows. So that's the picture. How do we define so many questions? Okay. So how can we find the such gravitinos? We can't find them in direct detection, they couple too weakly, but we can find them in indirect detection between the K, uh, for instance, through our parity validation, the gravitinos can decay, we mentioned that, and that, that will happen. Um, and at the LNC, we may be producing the superpart of the superpart of the K-to gravitinos, and therefore, in LNC searches, they uh, look for some gravitinos. Okay. So there are, you, it is possible to find this gravitino dark matter, but it's not that easy, because we cannot find it in the reputation. 
Questions? Okay, 25 minutes on axons. So axons are awesome. You should all spend uh, more time thinking about them. And let me try to give you a very brief introduction to what you do. So, <coughs> so here's the motivation, you all learned about QCD. And you always write this interaction with the gluons. But there is another term that one can write down. And this is the following. Well, G3 will have an access. So everyone has seen this? Has anyone? Who hasn't? No, who has? Sorry. Okay, good. Okay, so you all know. And you all know that it's classical, classically and uh, not important because it's a, a full derivative, right? And therefore it doesn't have any classical effect on our theory. Except that that's not true once we add fermions. Well, it's true classically, uh, but it looks like it doesn't have any effect. That starts being true when we add fermions, and once we have fermions, let's try it plus uh, some minus, some mass, psi left, bar, psi right. Once we add that, then then uh, there's an important effect. The point is that when the mass of these fermions go to zero, we have a symmetry, a classical symmetry, which is called the axial symmetry, under which <coughs> so the radical zero, there's an axial symmetry psi left goes to e to the i of psi left and psi right goes to e to the minus alpha psi right and this axial symmetry is anomalous, it's correct classically but it is anomalous otherwise namely at the quantum level uh, this symmetry is broken and the way we see that symmetry is broken is that and actually if you and uh, look at the measure of the path integral. You just show, you, you just look what is the effect of this transformation of the Jacobian, uh, which implies that theta goes to uh, theta, I guess, minus 2 alpha. So, under the symmetry, classically nothing happens. Quantum mechanically, theta, this term here, is shifted. So it seems that then this is not a physical parameter because we can shift it by some symmetry, but this is not a symmetry once we add mass theta. So we can still do the same transformation. Now, under this transformation, a redefinition of the field, if you want, it's, theta will still shift, but also the mass will go to the mass times e to the 2 i alpha. Right? So, for instance, if we want to go to, uh, if we take, so we can we can make this redefinition such that the mass say uh, is real, and we're going to get some phase that uh, goes <coughs> to this theta. So now there is a choice of theta, which is reparameterization invariant, namely that it does not change under uh, redefinition of the fields, and this is called theta bar which is just the theta that we wrote in the Lagrangian, uh, plus the argument of the determinant of the mass matrix of the quarks. Okay. So it's, one can show that this is just reparameterization invariant, and the fact that there are these phases simply just follows it, uh, can be easily understood if you, if you choose the basis where the masses are real. Then we uh, redefine 
all of fermions such that the masses are real, and this phase, the phase of the fermion, and these masses just are going to be theta. Okay. So this is the reparameterization invariant uh, object, parameter, and hence it is physical. What are the properties of this theta bar? It is uh, P and CP. It breaks both C, P and CP, and, so, and therefore we are supposed to see. And the way, uh, the place where it enters is at, so it enters in the neutral electric diode units. So we measure this uh, neutral electric diode moment. The diode moment depends on this theta bar, and so by measuring the, the EDM, we can constrain theta bar. And the constraint is the theta bar has to be smaller than roughly 10 to the minus 11. So there's a huge constraint on what is this parameter. And why? The question why is known as the strong CP problem. And the axiom will come to explain that, I mean, explain this problem. So let's okay, say that's the background. Any questions? Okay, so the idea is just imagine that instead of this theta, we would have a data dynamical field that would also couple to G, G triple. Okay. And let's imagine that the potential of this axiom, I'm going to call this particle an axiom, and let's imagine that this is a, this is a field. Let's imagine that the potential of this axiom is such that theta bar plus a over a is zero, wouldn't that be awesome? Then a would go to the minimum, there would be a phase transition, spontaneous breaking, oh, well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. If this was the potential, a would sit in its minimum today, and would get a to be zero. Completely consistent with measurements. So if we come up with a theory that, that predicts such a field, we need it. Okay? So that's the idea behind the axiom. And it turns out to be not so difficult, not trivial to calculate at all, but not so difficult to write a UV theory that gives you this, uh, this property. So let me very briefly tell you about the KSTZ the uh, Kim Schiffman Weinstein uh, Zakharov Zaka uh, axiom. All they need to do is to write a theory where there is an additional scale of field that we call it sigma that couples to two heavy fermions, non-standard model heavy new fermions. And there is some potential for sigma. Plus addition. There is a symmetry which is called the Pech and Quinn symmetry, related to the Pech and Quinn symmetry, under which psi left goes like e to the R, goes to e to the half of psi left, Psi right goes to e to the minus i alpha psi right, and sigma goes to e to the 2 alpha, 2 i alpha sigma. So that's a nice symmetry. It's very, uh, it reminds us of the axial symmetry we discussed before. And 
Let's assume that this potential provides a wave for sigma. So sigma, I'm going to write as some f a plus delta sigma times e to the i a over a. I'm just expanding my fluctuation. A is a Goldstone bottle. We're talking about the classical theory for now. So A is a Goldstone boson. And at low energy, I can integrate out these fermions. They would have a mass FA. And let's assume FA is much, much larger than the weak scale. We don't see it. So we plug this in here. We get very heavy fermions. We integrate them out. And at low energy, Our theory is just a standard model, plus some theory which depends on the Goldson boson, namely depend on the derivatives of A, because A is a Goldson, which is a massless field, it has a shift symmetry. And that would be our Goldman theory, everything would be perfect. Except that now we'll talk about the quantum effects. So number one, or more, more, most importantly, this, just as before, this symmetry is anomalous, and hence, under this transformation, and assuming that the psi left and psi right are charged under QCT, we have that theta bar is shifted to theta bar minus 2 alpha. Or plus 4 alpha, whatever. Also, it means that this is not a true Boltzmann bottom, and hence, we're going to have a potential for it. So let me tell you the answer, because we don't have much time. Before I write the potential, let me tell you one more thing. When we integrate out now the heavy fermions, there's another effect that is closely related to this anomaly. We can take the axiom, and if we integrate out the heavy fields, there is this diagram related to the anomaly that implies that A couples to the gluons, and the coupling goes to the GG twiddle. So it's not a surprise if you remember how I'm going to work, but just giving you the answer, this is the plus DUA stuff. Well, okay. Plus a kinetic term for, for A, plus another function of DUA, which I'm not going to write down. And of course, we have a standard QCD. That's what happens when we integrate out these fields. And this coupling just occurs through this diagram. The other thing that happens is that A is no longer a, a Goldson boson, it is a pseudo Goldson boson. Namely, it gets a potential, and one can calculate this potential. It's a highly non trivial calculation. And this is what you get. And the mass of the axiom is just given it as mu mv over mu plus mv times m pi. It is given you, it is given at low energy because QCD confines. And one can calculate that. It is 6 times 10 to the minus 6 EV times 10 to the 12 GV over FK. Okay? So two things happened. Because now this symmetry is anomalous, it's no longer true that it's an exact symmetry, therefore the Goldson boson is not really a Goldson boson, it's a pseudo Goldson boson. Still has a shift symmetry, but it also has this one non trivial interaction with the gluons, exactly through the theta bar in uh, proportion to together with the theta bar term. And it has a potential, and this potential is such that it is exactly minimum when it minimizes when uh, this equals to zero. And this equals to zero implies that we have no CP problem. 
So here's a solution to the strong CP problem. This is precisely the axiom that we wanted. This is the mass of the axiom. No, it's related. The mass of the axiom is roughly, very roughly, lambda QCD squared over FA. Okay? So there's a relation between MA and the mass scale related to the decay constant for the axiom, which is related to this wave. And it is very low. And then we really saw it. This is a lightning introduction. And one more thing to say, there are other interactions. I won't tell you how you get them, but in principle you can just write an effective action for this axon, and what you have is that in addition to this, you have an effective, so you have this coupling to GD primo, but you also have alpha over A pi and C A gamma gamma A over F times FF primo, where this is the electromagnetic uh, field strength. And you have, say, couplings to electrons, which go like 1 over f d u a. It has to be derivative interaction because it's a pseudo Goldstone times e gamma mu gamma phi e gamma mu because of this uh, pseudo Goldstone gamma phi because it is a CP old particle, so this has to be CP old. And there could be also interaction with neutrons and so on. Never mind. These couplings are usually of order either 0 or order 1, depending on the model. OK, since we are basically out of time, let me very, very quickly tell you what the cosmology of this action. Well, I, I, I was hoping to actually derive it, but let's let do it quickly. And so just the walls. What happens is that you can ask how is this axon produced, what is its density today? And so there are two statements. Well, there are only two. One statement is that the thermal production of this axon goes through but requires the axon to be very heavy. Uh, not very heavy, of order uh, 80 kV. 80 kV, I'm sorry. On the other hand, the lifetime of the axon, the axon can decay. It couples to this uh, photon, so there is this coupling. That implies that the lifetime of the axon, let me write down the lifetime, is of order 10 to the 24 seconds times Ev over Na. So to get the right abundance from thermal production of axions, one finds that it needs to be too heavy, which means that its lifetime is too short, much shorter than the life of the age of the universe, and hence it is not stable, it cannot be the dark matter. So that's not the answer. However, there's another production, and this production goes through the zero mode of the axon. So the axon, think about the axon as some field, and it has some wave, uh, which I, I'm calling the zero mode, it has no momentum mode, zero momentum mode. And it also could have some fluctuations about the zero mode, just like the heat, the standard model heat, can have any, some fluctuations. Now we can ask, how does the zero mode evolve? And then it's actually, again, in some limits, relatively simple. It is described by this equation. That's almost true for any, any zero mode of any particle. It's just the evolution in an expanding universe for a field that goes like a, a, a to the minus 3, a massive field, plus the potential. The potential is given by the potential that they wrote over there. And the only special effect that you need to take into account is the fact that the mass that I wrote, you, I wrote for you here is actually temperature dependent. Above the QCD scale, this mass gets, it becomes very, very small. It goes like roughly 1 over t to the 4. So that's a highly non trivial calculation. But because of the, the axon interacts with the plasma, it gets a very low, that its mass is reduced as you go to high temperature. So this whole equation is not completely trivial, but there are very three basic statements that one can make. When the mass of the down, when, when the Hubble scale is very large, so H much larger than MA of T, 
uh, you can ignore this part, and A is just frozen. This is called the Hubble friction, and A just sits there and doesn't move. When H becomes of order MA, this becomes important and it starts oscillating. So you have an oscillating field. Let's think of that as roughly MA squared times A. It starts oscillating, but at some point, um, but, it, but for a while it oscillates, and then at the same time, its mass changes. So, but at some point, its mass starts changing as the temperature drops, and A just behaves like regular matter, like cold dark matter. You can ignore this, it just oscillates, and A just goes like A to the minus 3. So the energy density goes like B to the minus 3. We had written down the equation of motion for, for the energy density, you would, have find, you would find something like that. So, when n dot goes to zero, A behaves like cold dark matter, and it's exactly what we see today. So that's why A can be the cold dark matter. There's a whole story around it, and, and, but one can derive the, the relative abundance in several cases, and it came to the dark matter. There are many, many bounds, and it's not so easy to uh, so many of these bounds come from, say, star pooling, because in stars like the sun, this accent can be produced, and when it produced, it leaves the sun, it takes some energy with it. There are constraints that changes the temperature profile in the sun, which changes the uh, neutrino spectrum that we see from the sun, and there are constraints from that. So all these constraints are on this F, okay? We can also look for it directly, and um, the way is so already just end with one, one type of experiment. So ADMX is a, is a nice experiment that looks for axioms. So all they have is this cavity. And they put some magnetic field, a coherent state, coherent state of photon. And an axiom from a galaxy can come along. Oh, I forgot to say. Note that FF twiddle in this interaction is just e dot b. So this implies an interaction of a times e dot b. So if we place some large magnetic field here, the axion can turn into a photon. So that's the idea here. The axion comes along and turns into a, a, a microwave photon, which we can search for. And this is one way of looking for the axion. It places a bound of FA anywhere. Uh, it kills the region of FA anywhere from 10 to the 11 GV and 10 to the 12 GV. And there are other ways, like shining through a wall, we put some magnetic field, you, you take a laser, you shine it, you, put some, you, you take some magnetic field, the magnetic field can turn this photon from the laser into an axion, you put a wall here, and you place another magnet here, more magnetic fields here, and you make the axon again turn into a photon. So now you shine light, and you look for the, for the light behind the wall. So you put some detector here. That's called the uh, light shining through wall experiments, and again they constrain some reading of the parameter space. You should remember that two things. First, I told you about the axon, but there are many axon light particles for which the relation between the mass and the decay constant f uh, is uh, both of the three parameters, the, the mass and the f are not necessarily related. So the parameter space is much larger, there are many, many experiments, many constraints that we could place, and it's still an open question whether this is the explanation, of course, and whether uh, and what and 
people are thinking of new experiments to try and uh, probe. It's very hard because it's so light, because it's so uh, weakly interactive, it's very hard to probe. And uh, people are also studying new different cosmologies that would explain that. And they say that if F, F it turns out to be larger than Z to the 12, then there is some tuning involved in the initial condition of the actor so that we get the right abundance. I didn't show that. But, <coughs> but um, and so it's also interesting to think about the cosmology of actually also the active field of research. And yeah, so I apologize I had to rush, but uh, that's the actual and I encourage you all to, to go some other more of them just infinitely. So thank you. Thank you.